Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Nice to have you with us. I've got a fun concert planned for you called First Time Tunes. I've had this idea cooking in the back of my mind for a couple of weeks, and I finally have enough songs ready to play them for you. The idea is that I will play uh, the first compositions by many famous composers. So we're going to do Scott Joplin's first rag. We're going to do George Gershwin's first song, Irving Berlin's first song, Fats Waller's first published song, and so forth and so on. And uh, I thought that would be kind of interesting. So let's get things started with the king of ragtime, Mr. Scott Joplin himself. Here is a very original edition of his first published rag, published by Carl Hoffman's Music Company in Kansas City, 1899. This is Original Rags. And as you can see in the early days, ragtime really had a lot of different meanings. There's a, there's a black man on the cover of the music picking up rags. <laughs> and uh, instead of saying composed by Scott Joplin, it says picked by Scott Joplin. Uh, now, I think, I think that's because the music sounds a lot like the picking of a banjo or a guitar. Uh, the music was arranged by Charles N. Daniels. Whether he really had much to do with it, I doubt. Uh, I imagine he just helped Joplin get the music published. This is not Scott Joplin's first published song. This is his first instrumental rag. And it's fittingly titled, Original Rags.
you so much. Original Rags by the one and only Scott Joplin. That's uh, unusual among the Joplin rags because it has five sections. Uh, the early rags were often based on march form, which only had three or four sections, but Original Rags has five. I thought I would play that for you and spare you uh, Joplin's first published song, which came out of a number of years earlier, 1895. I believe it's called A Picture of Her Face, and it's just a, a very sappy song, and I can't sing the lyrics, so I thought Original Rags would be better. <laughs> um, I, I did get some requests before tonight's concert, and I'm going to be able to fulfill one of those, which just came in by email today from uh, one of my friends and fans, Kelly in Florida. We're going to play Tom Turpin's very first published rag, and Tom Turpin was the father of St. Louis Ragtime. He owned the Rosebud Saloon in St. Louis, and in 1897, way back in the very early days, uh, he wrote the Harlem Rag. It actually was probably written a number of years before that, but it was published in 1897, and at the time, it was the first rag ever published by uh, an African-American composer. This is the Harlem Rag by Tom Turpin. so much. Harlem Rag. Well, looks like uh, there's no streaming issues tonight. Already up to 104 viewers on YouTube. That's not bad. And I think there's someone from uh, France. Is, is that right? That's amazing. Yeah, they say Tom Turpin was, was such a large man that uh, they had to put his piano up on bricks so that he could play it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I've always loved the Tur Turpin rags. There's only about a half a dozen of them. I wish there were more. Well, let's keep going. As I mentioned, a lot of the early instrumental rags were based on march form. 
So I thought I'd play you uh, an early March, one not written by John Philip Sousa. And uh, this fits in for tonight's concert because this was this composer's very first published piece, uh, at least his first hit. There might have been one other the same year. Uh, the man's name was Harry J. Lincoln. He was particularly well known for writing marches and he wrote the famous Repaz Band March, which has been played millions of times over the last hundred years. Uh, this piece, here's an original copy of it, was published by E.T. Paul, who was one of the other March Kings in the early 1900s, and the music that he published had the most beautiful cover artwork of any other music company. He often used five-color lithographs, and uh, this particular copy is not in great shape. I need an upgrade on my uh, copy of this music, but uh, it's called The Midnight Fire Alarm, and this is really a fun march. I've had some people in the Diamond Bell. Uh, I couldn't believe I got a request for this the other day, and I knew it just well enough to play it. And uh, so we're going to do it now. The Midnight Fire Alarm by uh, Harry J. Lincoln, arranged by E.T. Paul. Midnight Fire Alarm. It says at the top of the music, companion piece to the celebrated Ben-Hur Chariot Race March. Well, that one was actually composed by E.T. Paul. Uh, Midnight Fire Alarm was Harry J. Lincoln. Uh, usually about at this point in the concert, I make an announcement that I do accept virtual tips for these performances. All you have to do is send in a tip on PayPal or Venmo and uh, it's very helpful to my career. The, the PayPal and Venmo information is in the posting and the chat on all three websites. And uh, it has definitely been the number one thing that has helped keep my career going for the last four years or so. In fact, I have now been doing virtual concerts 
four years this month, I think. And I know I have a lot of regulars who, who uh, donate every week, and I'm most grateful to all of you. Up to 120 on YouTube, not bad. Plus 30 some on uh, Facebook, so we're over 150 listeners. That's terrific. I'm always happy to take requests as usual. I will probably be doing a number of instrumental rags tonight. I found it more difficult to think of the, the first songs written by uh, other famed composers of the American Songbook. You know, uh, for instance, I would not know how to play the, the first song written by Jerome Kern or the first song written by Calmer and Ruby or the first song written by um, Rogers and Hart. Rogers and Hart's first song might have been Manhattan. Somebody look that up, and if it was, I'll play it for, for uh, all of you. Uh, but uh, next, we're going to go way back in time to 1895, and I'm going to play for you uh, the first song written by one of the great African-American uh, songwriters and entertainers in history. His name was Burt Williams, a big star of the Ziegfeld Follies, and uh, with his partner George Walker, uh, two of the uh, legendary performers of the ragtime years. Burt Williams' first song was published out in San Francisco, believe it or not, in 1895. He must have been performing out there at the time. And the song is called Dora Dean. And the original subtitle was The Hottest Gal I've Ever Seen, but that was too racy for those days, so they changed it to The Sweetest Gal I've Ever Seen. Uh, so here is Burt Williams' first tune, and with it, just to flesh out the performance, I'll add another one of his comedy numbers, which is called I'll lend you anything I've got except my wife. I'll make you a present of her. So uh, here is Dora Dean, the hottest gal I've ever seen, and I'll lend you anything I've got except my wife. gal I've ever seen, written by the great Burt Williams. His biggest hit, I think, was Nobody, kind of a sad song. He was a comedian, but apparently was uh, a little bit of a, a sad character. Uh, those who knew him often said that. 
Well, one of the things I thought I might do tonight is play a few rags that were what you might call one-hit wonders. So it fits in for first-time tunes if the composer only ever wrote one song. And so uh, that's the case with this one. And I think I saw a request for that last week from Dave. We're, we're going to do Carbarlic Acid, one of the uh, great rags of the ragtime era, written by Clarence C. Wiley, who was a... Uh, pharmacist, and he lived in Oskaloosa, Iowa, so he named it off the shelf behind him, Carbarlic Acid, Hot Rag. <laughs> Dave says carbolic acid is fairly complex for a guy who just wrote one rag. Well, I guess so. Uh, it was complex to me when I first learned it when I was 11 years old. I remember that. Um, the first year I ever competed in the Old Time Piano Championship in the junior division, I was 11 years old, and I played carbolic acid and maple leaf frag. I, I still remember that like yesterday. Well, go ahead and send in some requests. I'll ask for the requests right now so that uh, by the time I finally get one that I know how to play, <laughs> I can do it for you. Sometimes it takes a while for them to come in on the chat. And uh, uh, so go ahead and send those in. I'll be watching. Unfortunately, I don't know Ashy Africa by Percy Winrick. I've never played that. I've already done Joplin's first rag, so we're probably not going to do much more Joplin tonight. I'll tell you what I will do is I'll play uh, another... A rag by one of the great classic ragtime writers. His name was Joseph F. Lamb. And uh, this, again, was not his first published composition, but it was his first instrumental rag. And here's an original copy of it. Sensation Rag. This is a little bit like Joplin's first piece. Scott Joplin's name is on here as arranger. It says arranged by Scott Joplin, but he really didn't have anything to do with it. He just helped Joe Lamb get the music published. And it was published by the Stark Music Company, the House of Classic Ragtime, in 1908. The uh, first section of this sounds an awful lot like Maple Leaf Rag. It's just like a banjo phrase if you listen to the first uh, section of this tune. And it's not to be confused with the Sensation Rag written by the original Dixieland Jazz Band. This is a different one. Sensation Rag by Joseph Lamb.
so much. Sensation Rag. Even though that's a, a legendary ragtime tune, that's the first time I've ever played it. There's a lot of the classic rags that I've still never played. And of course there's the wonderful story about how Joe Lamb met Scott Joplin by accident at the Stark Music Company in New York City. Poor Mr. Joplin had gout and was sitting there at the music uh, publishing company and uh, Joe Lamb walks in and wanted to buy some music and says, yeah, that's Scott Joplin. I'd sure like to meet him one of these days. And, and so uh, uh, I, think it was, I think it was John Stark's wife, Mrs. Stark, said, well, there's your man. He's sitting right there. <laughs> uh, Leo, I'm not going to play Frog Legs tonight. I think I did that last week for one thing. And second of all, that was not James Scott's first rag. His first rag was something more obscure. It was either On the Pike or A Summer Breeze or something. And I've never played uh, either of those tunes. So I'm afraid I'm not going to do James Scott tonight. <laughs> Let's move on to... Uh, one of the songwriters of the great American songbook, whom all of you know, uh, this, this man was a Russian Jewish immigrant, and he's the one who wrote God Bless America, White Christmas, and Easter Parade, believe it or not. He lived to be 101 years old. His name was Irving Berlin. I think he's truly just about the greatest American songwriter in history. And uh, he got his start as a singing waiter in New York, going way back to about 1906 or 1907. At that time, he, he couldn't play the piano. And uh, it was called the Pelham Cafe. And he began uh, performing there as a singing waiter. And then in the after hours, uh, after the cafe was closed, he would teach himself to play the piano. And he finally did learn to play, but he could only play on the black keys. I think he played almost exclusively in the key of F sharp. And later on, he had a special piano made with a lever that he could pull, and it would change keys for him. And so we're going to do Irving Berlin's very first published song, which came out in 1907. And I, this is another one I've never played before. I don't know if it's much of a tune or not. I will let all of you be the judge. Uh, this, Of course, this was at the height of the ragtime era, and Irving Berlin was known as a ragtime composer, uh, during the early part of his career, in fact, he would have been better known at the time for ragtime than a Scott Joplin in all likelihood. Now, uh, here from 1907 is Marie from sunny Italy, uh, one of the sheet music collector's most valuable tunes uh, that can ever be found because um, it was Irving Berlin's first. Now, the music was written by Mike Nicholson, who was the pianist at the cafe. Only the words were written by Irving Berlin, and his real name was Izzy Baleen. And uh, due to a, an error on the sheet music from the uh, music publisher, his name was listed as I Berlin. And from then on, he was known as Irving Berlin. And here is his very first uh, piece of music, Marie from sunny Italy.
sunny Italy. Thank you very much. I doubt there's too many people performing that on their live streams around the world today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Vanya says, educational indeed, Adam. Well, uh, that's what I put in my Facebook announcement this week, is that uh, this weekend's concert would be a little bit educational, uh, but I'll try and get in some requests, too. Oh, that's an interesting request. I would love to play Tom Breyer's first rag, but unfortunately, I, I don't know it. I know, I know Mike Dietz loves Irving Berlin, so I hope you got to hear that, Mike. Oh, uh, Heliotrope Bouquet would be an interesting choice. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and play that for you. Uh, let's do one more Joplin rag. Uh, so Akimi asked for that on Facebook. And it sort of fits in uh, it, because the first two parts of this were written by uh, Louis Chavon, who was one of the most legendary ragtime pianists in St. Louis, who uh, unfortunately died before he ever made any recordings. And it's the only rag, the only uh, instrumental rag written by Chavon that survives. Uh, however, he, he did have two uh, what you might call ragtime songs that were published. And uh, I think one of those came out uh, several years before Heliotrope Bouquet. There were two of them. Uh, they both might have been before the, the rag. Uh, the Moon is Shining in the Skies is one of them. And I think the other one is called Babe, It's Too Long Off, uh, something like that. And so those pieces do survive. I, if I'd had time, I might have um, tried to learn one of those. But anyway, let's do Heliotrope Bouquet because it's one of the most gorgeous rags ever written, uh, both by Louis Chavon and Scott Joplin.
trope bouquet. Thank you very much, everybody. Just checking the chat here. Oh, that's very interesting, Marilyn, about uh, Irving Berlin uh, receiving the Kennedy Center honors, but he couldn't travel there from New York to, to get it. I didn't know, I didn't know that story. Well, Heliotrope Bouquet is kind of a one-hit wonder, so that fits in. Now let's uh, go to a little bit different style of music and um, I'll play for you an early blues tune. Of course, the man who was called the father, originator, and creator of the blues was W.C. Handy, and his first published tune came out in 1912. Uh, it's the great Memphis blues, so I'll play that for you next. This is really the, probably the first piece of music written as a blues with the traditional 12-bar blues format in mind. He wrote it way back in 1909 as a theme song for uh, E.H. Crump, who was running for mayor of Memphis, Tennessee. And it was originally called Mr. Crump, and then the title was later changed to the Memphis Blues, W.C. Handy's first tune. so much. The Memphis Blues. As you can tell in the early days, blues and ragtime were almost one and the same thing. The blues just had a few more blue notes in it. Well, now let me see. I think I know what I want to play next for you. I just hadn't played this tune in a while, and, and it, I realized it fits in for tonight's concert. It is a first-time tune for both the composer and the lyricist. 
We're going to do a, a tune that was sort of the theme song for one of the great ragtime era vaudevillians and recording artists. His name was Gene Green. He got the nickname the Ragtime King. And uh, I collect Gene Green's records. I uh, would love to find some more of them. There's a whole bunch out there I still don't have. I, I have most of them. Uh, and uh, his vaudeville partner was Charlie Strait, who also became an important ragtime composer. He wrote Hot Hands, the Red Raven Rag, and uh, a lot of early novelty piano solos. And they joined forces, uh, at least by the year this was published, by 1909. And uh, later on, about 1912 and in 1913, they went to England and made dozens of uh, records for the Pathé Record Company in England. I have a few of those, but I would love to find more. And uh, like I said, this became Gene Green's theme song. He was uh, known for doing kind of a strange sort of scat singing on records. He was essentially the first person to do scat singing on records. It just made up words and nonsense lyrics. And that's kind of what this song is like. It's called King of the Bungaloos. I will be the King Gazoo, ruling high in my bungalow. I'll ride across the mighty Nile on the... On the royal crocodile, when on the throne, I take my stand. Then I'll be a mighty man. I'll be the Zuku Muku Grand and King of the Bungaloos. This is Charlie Strait's first published composition, as well as Gene Green. It was published by the Music House of Lemley, which was owned by Carl Lemley, who later became the founder of Universal Studios in Hollywood, believe it or not. actually sing that song, and one of the only ones is my friend Domingo Manquello. We recorded that on the CD we did together, which is called Take Me to the Land of Jazz. Now available at popular prices on my own website. <laughs> well, speaking of first-time tunes, uh, we have to include the legendary ragtime composer Hubie Blake. And uh, I had to look this up. His first two published tunes were copyrighted on the same day. I think it was October or something, 1914. And so I could really play either one of these tunes uh, that I want to choose for tonight's concert. The two pieces were Fizzwater and Chevy Chase. Now, I don't know Fizzwater by heart. So let's do UB Blake's a great Chevy Chase rag, 1914.
Chevy Chase Rag. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, yeah. Isn't it interesting how good U.B. Blake's music is? Even at the beginning of his career, he was an incredible composer with a gift for melody and interesting harmonies. Uh, some of the other pieces I'm playing tonight, you might notice, uh, because it's the, the composer's first song, they're not particularly sophisticated, really. Uh, uh, later on, I'll do George Gershwin's first uh, published song, which um, is not nearly as good as the concert works that he wrote later in his career. But, um, you know, uh, it's time to do another announcement. I do accept virtual tips for these concerts. All you have to do is send in a tip on PayPal or Venmo. If you want to help support my career, if you, if you like this kind of music, or, or if I'm able to answer a request for you or something, uh, please consider doing that. And if you don't trust PayPal, uh, there is also a P.O. Box on my website for checks. I appreciate all of you that do that. Every little bit helps. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, let's see, what should I do next? Oh yeah, I know what I need to do. I'm gonna play a piano roll for you tonight. And if you have uh, never listened to my concerts, I imagine most of you have, but if you haven't, this is a 1913 Apollo player piano. And I'm going to play this role since it was the first rag written by one of the important American composers and songwriters. His name was J. Russell Robinson. And uh, he wrote both classic rags, instrumental rags, and later on many popular songs in the 20s and 30s. His biggest hit was probably Margie. He also wrote I'll Be In My Dixie Home Again Tomorrow and uh, many other famous tunes. Swing Mr. Charlie, which was uh, Judy Garland's first record when she was a kid. Uh, but his career goes all the way back to 1909 when his first rag was published by none other than uh, John Stark, the House of Classic Ragtime. Now, I've never played this tune, so I thought I'd pull out the piano roll. And I know I've played this roll on a previous virtual concert. I can't remember exactly which concert or why I played the role. It's kind of unusual because uh, it's a 1950s role, but it is hand played by the composer J. Russell Robinson, and it's a piece that he wrote way back in 1909. It's called the Sappho Rag. And you can tell a couple of the harmonies, they're, they're very 1950s, but I, I think it's a great role, and at least you get to hear the piece. J. Russell Robinson's first time tune, Sappho Rag.
raffle rag. I'm so glad this has an automatic rewind. And it also has dynamic control, which is this lever here. I don't really exaggerate the dynamics too much. Uh, you don't do that with popular music as much as you do classical music. So you may not be able to hear it a whole lot. Uh, that's just because I don't do it very much. Um, but I do have that control with this player piano. Now let's move on to, to another blues tune, which I saw a request for this earlier and I was already planning to play it. This is Jelly Roll Morton's very first published composition called The Original Jelly Roll Blues, uh, which came out in 1915. Uh, the early ragtime era blues was all the rage at that time. Uh, but I've also heard some people consider this the first published jazz composition. So here again from 1915, Jelly Roll Morton's first time tune, original Jelly Roll Blues. <laughs> so much. Original Jelly Roll Blues. All right, well, I mentioned a composer a moment ago who I have to feature in tonight's concert, the one and only George Gershwin. And I've played this tune before because I've done Gershwin tribute concerts. Let's do it again. Uh, this is an example of where his first tune really does not live up to <laughs> the music which he was capable of writing. Uh, however, uh, it was a worthy first effort. And remember, at the time, Gershwin was a teenager. He was probably about 17 or something when he wrote this. 
Um, it was published in 1916. When you want them, you can't get them. When you've got them, you don't want them. Music by George Gershwin, words by Murray Roth. This was his first tune, the famous George Gershwin. so much. George Gershwin's very first song. Well, let me see. What do I want to do next? I think I'm going to play a real pretty waltz for you, uh, which was the first piece uh, written and published by uh, one of my favorite songwriters. Not a real famous one. His name was Glenn Rowell. Uh, but he was well known in the 1920s as a pioneer in the early days of radio and uh, with his partner Ford Rush he wrote I Get the Blues When It Rains. That was their biggest hit. But uh, way back in 1923 uh, he wrote this pretty waltz which is called School Day Sweethearts. I don't play it real often uh, but it, it's very pretty and shows that Glenn could write beautiful melodies. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out why, on the original sheet music, the composer's name is listed as Glenn Edwards. And then finally, I realized what it means. This tune is uh, based very loosely on the famous waltz School Days by Gus Edwards. And so when Glenn Rowell wrote School Day Sweethearts, they probably made a play on the name of Gus Edwards. And the composer's name is listed as Glenn Edwards. School days, school days, dear old golden rule days. That was such a famous song in the early 1900s that I imagine most people would have already understood it. So here's Glenn Rowell's first tune, School Day Sweetheart.
Thank you very much. School day, sweethearts. Now we'll do something with a little more pep in it. I did a quick Google search. I'm not sure if the information on this is exactly correct, but I wanted to know what Fats Waller's first tune was. Thomas Fats Waller, uh, the, the most legendary stride pianist in history, uh, because he became very commercially successful. He wrote for uh, nightclubs and shows, Broadway shows, he was in movies. James P. Johnson was one of his piano teachers. And according to Google, which of course knows everything, <laughs> Fats Waller's first published tune came out in 1924, and it was Squeeze Me. And so I looked in my files and I could not find the sheet music for Squeeze Me. And then I found it in a folio of Fats Waller's music. Uh, so I have not seen the original publication. I'm not 100% sure if this was actually published. Uh, the copyright date is 1925. 1924, 1925, as an individual song. I think it must have been, uh, because uh, that's what's uh, listed online. Um, I, I would assume so. It's a great tune regardless. So we're going to do Fats Waller's Squeeze Me. some people talking online. They want to know what my first composition was, so uh, maybe I will play that for you. Uh, perhaps I should save it as the finale for the concert. How about that? I'm just checking uh, all the websites here. Don't have anybody on Twitch tonight, that's too bad. <laughs> I only have about one more piece on my list for tonight, so I'm definitely gonna have to do uh, that request for my own tune. Looks like that came from a number of people. Uh, in the meantime, I mentioned that Fats was one of the most famous stride piano players, but there was uh, one more uh, besides Fats and James P. Johnson, who was quite famous. His name was Willie the Lion Smith. And it just so happens that I know by heart his first published composition. 
and it came out in 1925. The, the reason I know this is because I used it in the Old Time Piano Championship a number of years ago. And uh, uh, Willie's compositions are very neat. I never thought he was a very clean piano player, but his compositions are very clever. This is called Keep Your Temper. so much. Keep your temper. I played that in the Diamond Bell last night and told that to all the people sitting by the piano. <laughs> Did Johnny Matters compose any original rags? And if so, what was his first? Uh, maybe I'll play that in a minute. Uh, Friday Night Stomp would kind of be the first one. It's based on folk melodies, but that was the first rag that he wrote and recorded in the early 50s. But you, you, you know, uh, Carl, you just gave me another idea. Uh, I happen to know Johnny Mercer's first song by heart. Maybe I'll play that for you next, and then uh, I've got some other ideas to, to finish out the um, concert tonight. I believe, you know, maybe one of you can double check on this. It's if it's not the first, it's pretty close. Johnny Mercer's first song uh, was written in collaboration with Hoagie Carmichael. It came out in 1933, and it's a great tune called Lazy Bones. Uh, it was very famous at the time. Uh, you know, Hoagie Carmichael's music is so wonderful, but it was... Uh, uh, the reason I learned it is because my choir director in high school uh, knew this song and sang it with me. And I've been playing it ever since. So here is Hoagie Carmichael and Johnny Mercer's Lazy Bones. That's kind of how I feel right now.
very much. Lazy bones. Sleeping in the sun. How are you ever going to get your day's work done? I'm pretty sure that was Johnny Mercer's first song. I read that somewhere some time ago. Well, I got a request for the music of Johnny Maddox. So we're going to move to the 1950s now, and I'll play for you uh, what would kind of be considered his first composition, and there are only a very small handful that he ever wrote. Uh, it's called The Friday Night Stomp, and he recorded this for Dot Records in the early 50s, about 1951 or 52. It's based on a couple of old folk melodies, but very much in Johnny's style. Friday Night Stomp on a Sunday. Johnny Maddox. David on YouTube says Johnny Mercer's first song was Sister Susie Stretcher's stuff written at age 15. Well, that could be, but uh, kind of what I'm going by for tonight's concert is uh, the rule that it has to be the first published song. And uh, so that's different for, for uh, various composers. Um, before I play my last tune, go ahead and send in some more requests, folks. I uh, could probably fit in one more if it's something that I know how to play. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat here. Send in one more request. And uh, before I get around to the last song or two, uh, I do want to mention that I will be playing a virtual concert next Sunday night. It, it's Easter Sunday, I believe. So it will simply be my Easter concert. And I've done that before. I don't know very many hymns, but I probably know about three or four that I can rag up. And I'll do that for you along with whatever else you'd like to hear next Sunday night for my Easter concert. And then um, I had a brainwave that hit me the other day. I don't know where this idea came from, but I thought, you know what would be fun for a virtual concert is if I do a, a sort of name that tune game. I could play a song and then all of you in the chat could try and identify it. Now, I'm not going to be able to give out any prizes. Maybe if you get... 10 or 12 songs, I'll send you a CD or something. I don't know. Uh, but I thought uh, Name That Tune would be kind of fun. Let me know if you, if you like that idea. 
If you do, I'll probably do that the week after Easter Sunday. So um, that, that would be kind of fun. Let's see. You know, I'm afraid I can't play Pickles and Peppers too well without looking at the sheet music. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip that, Mike. Uh, well, Debbie says that would be cool and fun. Yeah, I think name, the, the, name that tune would be interesting, don't, don't you? Uh, I would, I would uh, have to come up with maybe some obscure tunes because a lot of you really know ragtime music very well. <laughs> Anyhow, let me close tonight's concert with uh, the first piece that I wrote that's any good. Uh, I'm going to qualify it that way. Uh, I wrote this when I was about, about 15 and uh, maybe had started on it when I was 14 years old. And this is more of a novelty piano solo. It's in the style of the 1920s novelties. And I named it after the little town in Texas where my grandfather was born, which is Novice, Texas, a little town of oh, about 120 people. And the family legend is that he was born in a cabin built by Davy Crockett in Novice, Texas. So this is my first uh, really adult uh, composition, which is called A Novice Novelty. <laughs> much a novice novelty by me <laughs> um, you know I think I'll probably end the concert there tonight I, I thank you all so much for listening I appreciate every one of you uh, don't forget to hit the like button share the live stream if you enjoy this kind of music let your friends know about it and I will be back next Sunday night with my uh, now annual Easter concert I'm looking forward to it very much Thank you also for the virtual tips, those of you that can do it. It's uh, most helpful. And uh, thanks again for listening. We'll see you next week, folks. Good night for now.